Today I'm remaking a classic float animation that I've seen in a lot of awards winning websites. My process to remake this animation was pretty straightforward. First, I went in Blender and created a 3D scene with a bunch of shapes that I imported inside a canvas. Then I used the float utilitary function by React 3 Dre to add a basic float effect to every single shapes. And finally, I used frame motion to add some asymmetry to the animation based on the position of the cursor. So yeah, let's see this in detail. And as always, you can find the live demo and the source code in the description below. All right, so I have a very basic Next.js application here, but for this tutorial, you could use any React-based framework. It won't change anything. And so for now, I just have an empty project. It looks like this in the browser. And the first thing I'm going to do here is create an external component, and I'm going to call it like floating shape. And it's like a very basic function here. And then I just import it inside of the page.js, and we should have something like this. And then the first thing I can do here is import a canvas from React 3 Fiber, and that's going to be the parents of everything inside of this animation. And so I'm just going to put the canvas here and I can delete that. And the basic structure that I'm going to have here is basically I'm going to have the models and I'm going to have the environment here. And so to have the models here, I'm going to create another component inside of the floating shapes and I'm just going to call it model.gsx. And now inside of that guy, I'm going to initialize all of my shapes. And to make all of my shapes, I've used Blender here to create everything that I want. And you can see here the perspective. I've put them quite far away from each other because I want to like rotate them and I don't want to have like any collision. And so that's why it looks like this. But if we look at it from a forward angle, we can see that it looks quite natural, right? It looks like they are all grouped together. And it's also important to note that my material here is just like a really basic material. I've just clicked like new material and chose a color, all right? Nothing too complicated here. And it's also important to note that all the names here of the layers, they're basically gonna be the reference that I'm gonna use to import them inside of the canvas. And so once we know all of that, we can go ahead here in the file and do export. And I'm gonna export it in GLTF or GLB file. And now to visualize your GLB file, you can actually use this really useful tool from Poimendras. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but, and so I'm just gonna take my floating shapes and I'm gonna drop that file inside of that website. And with that, I can basically see my scene here. I have all of my shapes that I've made in Blender and that's how they would look inside of the canvas. And I can actually see the options that they put. And one thing that's quite important is the environment here, which I'm also gonna use. And this basically changes the lighting. And so you could have like night and you can see the lighting is quite different. You could have like park and you see that the color and the lighting changes. And then on this side, we have like the code. It would basically look like this. Of course, I'm not gonna copy paste this because there's a way more efficient way of doing this, but it kind of gives you an idea of what it's going to look like. And also, I forgot one thing. I need to specify here in the root of my floating shapes component that this is a client component. And so we basically tell them, hey, we're on a client and not on the server. And yeah, after that, I'm going to go in the public folder and create a medias folder. And I'm going to grab my floating shapes GLB file. I'm going to put it inside of the media. And now I basically want to extract all the meshes from that file. And so inside of the model components, I'm going to have here an import. And I'm going to import the use GLTF from React 3 Dre. And this is basically the same thing as mentioned here. I'm going to grab the nodes and the materials, but actually I won't need the materials here. So I'm just going to grab the nodes. And here I need to specify that it is inside the media folder. And there's also one thing missing. I'm just going to grab that line here to preload. And same thing, I'm going to specify medias and that should be good. And now instead of just copy pasting all of that, which is like a lot of repetition, I'm just going to create here an inner component and I'm going to call it a mesh. And that mesh will take a node as a parameter and it's going to return here basically a mesh from 3JS. And now all of those information here, I'm going to extract them from the node. And so I'm going to have here the cast shadow, the receive shadow scale. And now instead of having like react fragments here, I'm just going to create a group, which is basically a group of mesh. And I'm going to have a first mesh, which requires a node as a parameter. And I'm going to do nodes dot. And so what I can do is just check here. I'm going to take like for one, for example, I'm going to take like the sphere, maybe sphere 003. And I'm going to save that. Now I have a very small black sphere here. I'm just going to inspect that. And I can see that my canvas is like really small. And so the first thing I want to do is like make that full screen. And so if I go back in the root of everything in the page.js, I have the main here. And so I'm just going to style the main to be in display flex and have a height of 100 viewport height. And now if I take a look at this, I have my canvas taking the full height and full width. And I have my black sphere here. And so that's basically it. I'm going to do the same thing, but for all of the meshes inside of the scene. And I can use that visualizer to really see all my meshes. And that's going to help me. And there we go. I'm done. Now you might ask, why am I creating a mesh like one by one like this? Why am I not just looping the nodes and just having like a nodes.map and returning all of the meshes at once inside of a loop? And the reason why is eventually I'm going to add a multiplier that's going to be a constant value 
that's going to be different for every single mesh. And with that, I'm going to be able to create a variation between all of the meshes, all right? That's the reason why I'm not looping the nodes. Now, if I take a look at the result, I have something like this. It's quite worrisome. It looks like trash, really. It's like not even the right perspective. It's all black. Like, what the hell is going on here? I would expect to have something that looks like this, but really, I have something like this. But it's no problem. We're going to fix it. First thing we want to fix is go inside of the root of the floating shapes. And inside of the canvas here, I'm going to specify a camera. The first thing I want to do here is specify that I want an orthographic camera. And now the difference between an orthographic camera and a perspective camera is I can basically show you that inside of Blender here. And so this is an orthographic perspective. It squashes the perspective. There is no distortion the closer the object is to the camera. Whereas a perspective camera, it's going to look something like this, right? The cone here is really close to the camera, so it appears bigger. Whereas like this tube shape here is further away from the camera, so it appears smaller. So that's the difference between a perspective and an orthographic camera. And personally, I like this look more for this specific animation and that's why I specify an orthographic camera. And then I'm going to add some options here for the camera. The first thing is I'm going to have a position which is a vector 3 and so on the x and on the y I'm going to have 0 and then on the z I'm going to have 200 meaning the camera is going to be closer to us and it's going to look at the objects like this. And now 200 on the z axis is quite far away so what I'm going to do is have a zoom of 10. And so it's going to be far away from the objects and then it's going to zoom in. So I can save that and see the difference here and boom now you can see that I have something that looks way more like my blender scene something like this and i'm quite happy with that now of course everything looks black and that's because there is no light in the scene and if we go back in the visualizer here we can see in the environment here this is what's lighting this scene here and i kind of like this lighting it's like really simple to to create i don't have to like put a point light and choose a position. I'm just going to put an environment. And so I can take a look at the dawn and like the lobby and all of that. They all have different lighting. And personally, the one I really like is the studio lighting. It's this one here. So and so how do we translate that into our code? I'm going to go back in VS Code here. And that's basically the environment that we have here. And now I'm going to import here the environment from React 3J. And I'm going to have an environment at the root here inside of the canvas, but not inside of the model. And really easy, I can just do preset is equal to studio, which is the one that I selected in inside of the visualizer. And if I take a look at the result, I have something like this. I have my shapes with some lighting. But personally, I'm not a fan of like the white background with this lighting specifically. It just looks too bright for my own taste. So easily, what I'm going to do here is just add some styling to canvas. I'm going to have a background and I'm going to put a color that I specifically chose. And I should have something like this, which to me helps to see the contrast. I prefer it that way. So yeah, now we're done importing the shapes and I'm going to make everything float. Now for the floating, there is a utilitary function that's really useful inside of the drape package. If you do 3D and you don't know about it, you should definitely check it out. There's a lot of useful tools inside of that. And so I'm going to go here and I'm going to look for the float. And I can take a look at their demo here. They basically have like a ship and an astronaut that's floating. And what they do here is basically add a float on top of their shapes. And so I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to go inside of the model. And here I'm going to import float from React Tree Dre. And I'm just going to put the float as a parent of the group of meshes. And easy like that, I have a bunch of floating shapes. Now, there's a couple of things that I don't like about this. One thing is everyone can add a float and basically do the same thing that you just did. All right, so what I want to do here is to add some asymmetry, make my animation a bit unique than just like the basic presets of a utilitary function. And another thing that I don't like is it's not interactive. Like this could be a video and I wouldn't even see the difference. And so to solve those two problems, I'm basically going to add some interactivity with the mouse and create some asymmetry. And I'm going to use Framer Motion for that. So since I want to use the mouse to create some interactivity, the first thing I want to do here is grab the position of the mouse and store it in inside of a state. So the first thing I'm doing here is adding a use effect hook that's going to trigger an event listener on mouse move. And that's going to call a function called manage mouse move. And then I'm creating a mouse object with an X and Y value that I initialize with the use motion value hook from firmer motion. And inside of the manage mouse move, I extract the client X, the client Y, and I set the X and the Y with the relative position of the X and Y. Now for the mouse, I could be using a react state but instead, I'm going to use a motion value from frame of motion because the frame of motion value basically has an inner state. And that's actually better for performance because now every time I move my mouse, I'm setting a new position for the mouse, which if it is a React state, it's going to re-render my whole component every time, which is not the best. Now, instead, I use a use motion value, which has an internal state. And so only the objects that are going to use the mouse will be re-rendered. And then I'm just going to pass the mouse to the model here. And now the model has access to the mouse. 
And then I'm just gonna give the mouse to the mesh here. So they're gonna manage their own animation, something like this. And now the mesh here has access to the mouse. And so the first animation that I can create here is a rotation on mouse move. So first thing I wanna do here is I'm gonna create here a rotation X, which is gonna be equal to the use transform hook. And that use transform is from firm motion, by the way. And now the use transform function here basically is gonna help me transform the position of the mouse, which is a value between zero and one. And then I can choose new values from it. And so I could have the current rotation x and I'm going to do minus one to the current rotation x plus one. And so with that, we basically have a rotation x. The more the mouse goes to the right, the more it's going to rotate on the x. And if it goes to the left, it's going to rotate on the x, but the other direction. And then I can basically just grab the rotation x here. I can do rotation x is equal to the rotation x. And now this rotation x value here is a motion value. It's not like number. And so I need to add the motion tag here in front of the mesh for it to work. And I'm going to import it here. And I'm going to save that. Oh, and here I need to specify that it is the X that I want for the mouse. And I'm going to import that motion here. And it's actually not from firm motion. Now the motion will come from firm motion 3D. And I can try this, see what we have. I'm going to move my mouse. And you can see that if I move my mouse on the X axis, it's actually moving all of the shapes here. Now I definitely see a couple of problems with that. The one is the rotation is like directly linked with the mouse. There is no like easing, there is no lerp. And another problem is all the shapes are rotating by the same amount. And so it doesn't look natural at all. And so I'm going to tackle the first problem, which is making the mouse smooth, adding an easing so it's not directly linked with the mouse. And it's actually going to be real easy. I'm going to go in the root here where I initialize my mouse and I'm going to have instead a smooth mouse, which is going to be equal here on the X to the use spring hook from firmer motion. And I'm basically going to use the mouse.x and same thing on the Y axis, but I'm going to use the mouse.y. And then I'm just going to grab my smooth mouse. And instead of giving straight up the mouse, I'm just going to give the smooth mouse. And let's see what I have here. If I move my mouse, you're going to see that I kind of have an easing. There's like a spring animation happening, like the shapes are rotating and they're, they're like coming back a bit, which is not really the effect that I'm looking for here, but that's the basic options of the use spring hook. And so all I have to do is modify the options here to have the effect that I want. And there's this really nice visualizer, which is like firm motion visualizer versal app that allows you to basically visualize the use spring hook because it's, it's quite complicated. It has three options. One is stiffness, damping, and mass. And like, it's kind of hard to visualize if you don't understand what's happening behind the scenes. And so this visualizer is really nice to use. And those are the values that I ended up choosing for my animation. And I can basically grab them and put them here as options for the smooth mouse. And I can save this and I'm going to see what I have. And now you can see that this is looking much more realistic for a floating animation. And now the second problem is I have no variation, right? All of the shapes are rotating at the same time, which is not super natural. I would like to have some variations between all of the shapes. So now instead of just rotating with a constant value here, I'm going to have basically a unique value for each each mesh. And so what I'm going to do is add a multiplier here. And so I could have like a multiplier of 2.4. Now I'm going to have access to a multiplier here. And now instead of using a constant, I'm just going to do minus the multiplier. And now all I need to do is have a unique multiplier for all of my shapes that I can choose personally, depending on my taste. And so I have something like this different multiplier for the different shapes. I personally gave a smaller multiplier for the biggest shapes so that it looks like realistic with the physics. And I can try this out. And you're going to see that all of my shapes here are not rotating by the same amount. And that's something that I really like. And now I'm just doing a rotation on the X axis. And I basically have the perfect structure to change any properties that I want. So I'm going to do rotation Y, position X and position Y. So for the rotation Y, I'm just going to do the same thing, but mouse Y instead, rotation Y here and rotation Y here. And then I'm going to have a position X. I'm going to do the same thing, mouse X. But here, instead of taking the current rotation, I'm going to take the current position and then same thing for the position Y. But now I'm taking the mouse Y. Here is position X. And here I'm going to add them in the properties. I'm going to have rotation Y, position x so yeah something like that and now all of my shapes are moving a bit and they're also rotating depending on the position of my cursor but this animation looks quite odd it doesn't look natural at all with the interactivity and i believe it's because when i move on the x axis i would like to rotate the shapes on the y axis so here on the rotation x i'm going to take the rotation y value and on the rotation y i'm going to do the rotation x just reversing those two axes for the rotation and now yeah this looks a bit more natural you can see that it's actually moving according to the position of my mouse and there's another thing that i don't like i think it's rotating a bit too much and it's not moving enough so i can fix that pretty easily i'm going to have here a constant i'm going to call it a and i'm going to have it be the multiplier divided by two and i can actually use the a for the rotation 
addition. Instead of using the multiplier, I just basically use the A, which is the multiplier divided by two. And so I'm going to have a bit less of a rotation. And now for the position, I'm going to do a multiply by two. So I'm going to have more of a translating animation. So I should have something like this. And so it seems to make sense on the X axis for the translation, but on the Y axis, if I go up, my shapes are going down. And if I go down, my shapes are going up. So I'm just going to reverse the values here for the translate Y. I'm going to do plus here and minus here so that it's reversed. And now that makes a lot more sense. If I move my mouse, this looks quite like a natural effect to me. And so, yeah, that's basically the animation. A really nice floating effect with some mouse interactivity. I hope you learned something. If you like the video, leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.